Uh, I'm going to read our opening script for remote meetings. As a preliminary matter, this is Amanda Fargiano, Chair of the School Committee. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Meg Tyler? Yes. Nancy Cavanaugh? Yes. Joe Markey? Yes. Uh, and Aaliyah Batley Rafferty is not here tonight, and I am present. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Carol Cavanaugh? Yes. Susan Rothermick? Yes. And Dr. Cavanaugh, is Ms. Parson joining us tonight? Oh, she is not. So okay, thank you. you. Um, and do we have any anticipated speakers for tonight? Other than Susan and I, no. I didn't think so. Okay. Um, this open meeting of the Poppington School Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's execu executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mit mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we are complying with the executive order that suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. All members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The executive order, which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely as long as the public body makes provision through adequate alternative means to ensure interested members of the public are provided reasonable access to the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. For this meeting, the school committee is convening via Zoom video conference as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Additionally, the meeting may be broadcast by HCAM. HCAM Ed TV is broadcasting tonight's meeting for the community to participate. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that others may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials have been provided to members of this body and are available on the town's website via the web meeting calendar, unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda, unless noted otherwise. We are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, I will invite board members to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until I yield the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. For public comment, we have asked the community to submit public comment via email by 5 p.m. this evening, and we have received public comments, which uh, Joe Markey will be reading shortly. With that said, I would like to call the meeting to order and invite you all to stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance, Allegiance to the flag, flag of the United, United States of America, America and to the Republic, the Republic for which it stands, stands one, nation, one nation, under God, God indivisible, indivisible with liberty, liberty, and, and justice, justice for all. For all. Okay, uh, I just want to take a moment before we uh, move into the agenda tonight. Uh, some members of the community or the panel may be aware that one of our colleagues uh, has lost someone to COVID-19. And we want to take a moment and just have a moment of silence to recognize not only her loss, but um, we know that so many people in the community have dealt with both illness and loss um, as a result of this virus. So we're just going to take a moment if you will allow me. Uh, Thank you so much for that. And our 
thoughts and prayers go out to all those who are struggling um, and dealing with loss, especially at the holidays. Um, it's very difficult. So um, we know that the community has, a, there's a lot of suffering going on in the midst of, you know, the fun of the holiday season. So we are, we have a pretty full agenda tonight. Um, we're going to start off with the superintendent. Oh, first of all, we're going to start with public comment. As I mentioned, we have received uh, a few public comments and uh, Joe has offered to read those on our behalf tonight. Okay, thank you. Uh, the first letter is from Chris Taco uh, from Hopkinton. He says, I was very pleased to see leadership with DESI moving to prioritize live instruction every day as summarized below from press article 12, 15, 20. To set expectations, can you please comment on how HPS plans to address this requirement? with the assumption that this mandate takes effect before HPS is planning for schools to open full-time five days a week. Perhaps this is part of the agenda for this evening to discuss full-time reopening, or it could be considered in conjunction with briefly discussing form all HPS admin are aware and plan to comply with this to bring live instruction to students every day, even if remote. As it seems, DESE is now mandated. Unless some very creative accounting for hours that currently make up live instruction, I can attest that at least Hockenden High School falls into the failing category by this new standard that needs attention. And I'm hopeful this policy will finally properly bring this long voice concern to the table for action. Related, I have found it quite refreshing how Rich Cormier in conjunction with many seems to have been exercising the right amount of creativity to effect sports for our student athletes. So I'm pleased that this administration seems to be finally be moving forward towards similar creativity, proactively work around the often voiced obstacle of lunch complexity to make full-time or close to full-time schooling the option it should could have been from the start of the school year at the pleading of many in the community. And then he quotes a press article He's, he summarized the saying, the state's Board of Elementary and Secondary Education adopted new standards around online education amid concerns that it has left many students dealing with anxiety and depression. Quote, uh, Boston Globe article 121520, many of our children are struggling with the isolation that comes with remote or even hybrid learning. Education Commissioner Jeff Riley said he proposed the standards. Under the new rules, school offering a mixed online and in-person class Classes must average at least 3.5 hours a day of live instruction, which can include online or in-person teaching. Schools that are fully online will have to average four hours a day of live teaching. All schools must offer some live interaction every day. The rules take effect January 19th. Riley proposed the changes after a state survey found that many students had at least one day every two weeks without live interaction with the teacher. About one third of schools currently fail to meet the new standards that state found. The measure was approved with a vote of seven to four. State education officials previously urged schools to prioritize in-person learning, but had set no standards for live instruction. And that ends the summary from the press account. And then he closes his letter. Thank you for the work you've done to date and in advance for addressing this initiative toward prioritizing not only staff preferences and our students' safety, but also continuing to promote students' socioeconomic and learning needs throughout the remainder of this academic year. That I hope a return to some form of more live in-person instruction will make possible. Regards, Chris Taco Hopkinton. There's a second letter uh, from Dr. Andrea Cotter of Hopkinton. And she writes, Dr. Kavanaugh and school committee, I wanted to reach out and let you know how happy I am that you are setting up a committee to evaluate how to return children to full in-person learning. I have children in second and fourth grade, both doing the hybrid model. And while I think it is the best model for the current situation, they're clearly not getting the education they would in a traditional year. I know that you have worked tirelessly to assure the safety of our teachers and students through this very difficult time, but I'm hopeful as the numbers trend down in the spring, we can have a plan to transition back to full in-school learning as this would be what is best for the students. I completely understand the risks of COVID. 
I'm an emergency physician in Worcester and have been caring for COVID patients since March. I fully agree that right now with the cases and hospitalizations rising, it is not the time to go full in person, but I do feel we need to plan. Once the worst of this winter is behind us, the numbers will trend down, mostly as this is likely seasonal, like other coronaviruses, and as restrictions increase in the winter. And my hope is then we can prioritize in-person learning for our children. If I've learned anything through this pandemic in the emergency room, it's that if you don't have a plan, things will not get done. So I feel it is important to brainstorm now to have a plan for March, April, for getting the kids back to school for a few months. I know that there are many barriers to this, but am hopeful that we can come up with some creative solutions to the lunch bus problem that have been cited. Some ideas would be a shorter day with no lunch in school. Some districts are going 8.30 to 1 p.m. with lunch at home. Also, since there seems to be less transmission among younger children and they're significantly easier to contract, too easier to contact, trace, a possible solution is sending K3 or K5 back full time, keeping middle and high school hybrid. As far as lunch goes, I have listened to the school committee meetings and I understand there is an issue with supervising the kids if they are spread out into classrooms or the gym cafeteria during lunch. Would it be possible to have parent volunteers help out with lunches so more distancing can take place? Obviously these ideas may not be feasible, but I feel we have a strong, smart community that is very committed to helping get our kids back to school. If we work together and brainstorm, we may be able to come up with some creative compromises to help everyone feel as comfortable as possible. Thank you again for your tireless work in getting our children this far during this crazy time. I am happy to help in any way that I can going forward. Sincerely, Dr. Andrea Cotter. Amanda, that's all we have for letters today. Amanda, if I can interrupt, I, I got an email that it doesn't seem the meeting is on HCAM. Is that, can we confirm that it is? So I believe it's on HCAM Ed TV, but it's not on other HCAM channels. So they'll have to dial into the TV, uh, in Comcast or Verizon. So that's HCAM. correct. And it's not the same channel. I got an email saying from one person saying it's on channel 96. I'm not sure if that's Verizon or Comcast, not the usual channel. I'm what? guessing that's because it's HCAM Ed. What's the channel, Nancy? I'll let them know. It's channel 96, but I don't. that would apply to either Comcast or Verizon, and I'm not sure which. I think that's Comcast. All right. I'll try to get them up and running. <laughs> Thank you. And I believe the recording will be available within a day or two as well, still, even though it's on TV. I guess I'm looking to see if, 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 if that's not true, if someone could just text me and let me know, but I do believe this is being recorded and will be available. And then the 96 is Comcast, you're correct. I, I just heard that from. Okay, I guess we'll forge ahead. Um, thank you, Joe, for reading those. Uh, turning to the superintendent's report, Dr. Kavanaugh. All right, so before I get, begin that report, I would like to just make a couple of recognitions. Um, one is uh, just a shout out to Project Just Because. They called us the other day and offered us up 3,000 masks. Um, so I, I can't tell you how valuable that is because we are always, you know, handing them out again and again to students who lose them or faculty who need them or, you know, building and grounds or cafeteria. So they do go very quickly. So to have those 3,000 masks is really exciting. Um, and then my second thank you goes out to our uh, building and grounds custodial and maintenance guys. Um, while we are all in our warm houses on a day like today when the wind is howling and the snow is flying, they are actually at school doing a lot of snow removal. So when we arrive tomorrow morning and our driveways are cleared and we're ready to open our doors, it's because they have been there. And also, and so too has the town's highway department. So um, a shout out to Mike Manser and, and all of his guys in the highway department. So thank you to those two groups. We do appreciate it um, more than you'll know. 
All right, so I will get started on the superintendent's report. I will take the screen. There we go. So here is the superintendent's report for Thursday, December 17th, 2020. Um, I know that I put this in every superintendent's report, but the clock is ticking. Um, our flu vaccine deadline is on December 31st, so we really need for our kids to be flu vaccinated and for that documentation to come into the public schools. Um, why are we doing this? I tell you all the time. Uh, the, uh, Dr. Larry Madoff, who is the director of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health Infectious Diseases, tells us that flu shots are going to save lives this winter. Um, if parents need any more information, you can go to the mass.gov Department of Public Health website for any additional information. And the sooner our families get that documentation into the school, the easier the record keeping is going to be for our nurses. We've got six plus a little bit of a nurse across five buildings and they are working super hard all the time. So if you can get us your paperwork, we would appreciate that. All right, um, new COVID quarantine expectations. Uh, Sean and I, Sean McAuliffe, the public health director in Hopkinton had a conversation today. And I just think it's important that we share this information with people in the community because I'm sure that when the school nurses or the town nurse or Sean calls a family to talk about uh, quarantining, you know, if you have, have been called twice or if your neighbor was called and then later you were, you wonder why the, the rules seem to be changing in the middle of the game. And I know that that might make people doubt that we know what we're doing, but, but we do know what we're doing and we are doing what is directed to us, not only by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, but they have now teamed up uh, with DESE so that the regulations that DESE is putting forth and the Mass Department of Public Health are sort of in sync with each other. So we're grateful for that. The Massachusetts Department of Public Health would take the stance that the quarantine period is still 14 days, even though it appears not to be in terms of when people are out of our school community and when they are welcome back into our school community. But they are watching for that person's wellness over a 14 day period. So what we need to share is that members of the school community, if they are starting to have COVID symptoms or if they have been um, if they have been exposed, I should say, if they've had an exposure to someone who is COVID positive, they should test now on day five. That's the recommended day of testing, five days after your exposure. And that test can be a PCR or an antigen test. So that is something also that has changed. Um, if the person is tested on day five, and that person has no symptoms, the person is fever free, the test comes back negative, the person can return to the school community eight days after the date of last exposure. So test on the fifth day, return on the eighth day. However, uh, that person still has to self-monitor for the 14 days and report any symptoms to the health department. So even if you test on the fifth day, you're back in school on the eighth day and you start to have some aches and pains or you start to have a scratchy sore throat, you do have to report that to the health department. So we don't want people to feel like they're in the free and clear after day eight, there's still a 14 day requirement. Now we have said from the beginning that we can't compel people to test and that remains true. So if there is a person who opts not to test, that person can come back into the school community on the 11th day after the last exposure. And just like in the case above, that person would still need to monitor for symptoms. So you've stayed out for 10 days, you come back on the 11th day, no testing, no symptoms, but on the 12th day you start to feel ill, you need to report that to the public health officials. And then finally, and this might be the best news I think families are going to encounter, is that siblings of close contacts are no longer required to quarantine. Now, what would happen before is if um, you had a 10th grader, for example, and that 10th grader was in a math class with someone who tested positive, then your 10th grader would stay out of school as a close contact, but so too might your eighth grader and your sixth grader, they might be out of school as well as siblings of close contacts. That's no longer the case. Siblings may return, um, don't have to stay out at all, I should say. All right, and then 
I know people find this information um, interesting. This slide was created on Tuesday. So all of the data that you see here was current as of Tuesday in this week. Um, what I've done is I've broken it down by high school, middle school, Hopkins, Elmwood Marathon, and then uh, personnel who work um, across the district or you know, at the um, administrative district level. So as of Tuesday in the Hopkinton Public Schools, we've had 38 cases all together. 34 of those cases were people who are in person uh, every day. Four of them have been offsite, 12 have been adults, and 26 have been students. And just to break that down a little bit further, the high school has had eight, the middle school 10, Hopkins two, um, Elmwood eight, Marathon eight, and district personnel at one. Um, Total active cases as of Tuesday, we were at four. And the number of currently quarantined people in our schools at that point in time uh, was 93. So you can see the quarantine numbers at the high school. We had two adults and 23 students. At the middle school, six adults and 20 students. At Hopkins, one adult and four students. At Elmwood, five adults and eight students. Marathon, one adult, 21 students. And at the district level, we had two quarantined people. All right, this is a question that I keep getting over and over again. Are we going remote after the December break? And I know that people will liken this break to um, the Thanksgiving break where we did go remote for a week. At this point in time, it's really important for people to know that we have no plans of going fully remote after um, the, the December break, so that first week in January. Uh, these are some of our, our reasons why, at this point, we have no plan to do that. Um, our, in talking with Sean today, um, as I've already mentioned that, that I did, um, he has shared that case counts are actually declining right now in Hopkinton. And as it was reported on December 8th, the 14-day case count was 62 um, with the daily incidence rate at 27.05, uh, which means that Hopkinton is still a community that is in the yellow. And you know that the commissioner has often said that if you're not in the red, you should be back in school full time. Obviously districts have taken a much more cautious approach, but we are yellow, so I feel like we should be in school. Um, the second fact is that the Christmas holiday is on the 25th of December. And that is typically the, the holiday, that moment in time when people like to travel. So they like to travel and be with family or friends on the 25th. And then because Christmas falls on a Friday this year, it would seem somewhat logical that people would be returning home on Sunday and getting back to work on the 28th of December. Uh, additionally, we have athletics going on uh, the week of the 28th. And so we are hoping that our student athletes will be in the community and that they will be showing up to you know, practices or contests. And um, if that's the case, just a reminder to our student athletes that you know one positive person on any team will you know cause that will sort of dismantle that team for a little while. Uh, so our return to school date is January fourth. So that leaves an awful lot of time for COVID testing. And then the third fact is that we are partnering with the health department, so they are now able to do the antigen tests, which are fine for um, coming back to work or school after um, the the travel order. So on January 4th, if we have heard from faculty and staff that they would need a COVID test to return to school, we can offer those on Monday morning, January 4th. Um, hopefully, if they are available, so again, we're partnering with the health department to any faculty or staff who have traveled. And thank you to the health department for being able to uh, partner with us. Hopefully, that will work out. All right, I know a lot of people are wondering about the changes that um, the Board of Education's vote is are making to the Hopkinton Public Schools delivery of education during the pandemic. So the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education did have a vote on the 15th, which was Tuesday of this week. We are considered to be a hybrid district. So even though we have some students who are remote, and some students who are hybrid, we are considered to be a hybrid district. And so it's the hybrid um, regulations that we need to, to adjust to. 
So what Jesse has said is that um, if you're a hybrid district, you need to provide an average, and I think average is an important um, term there, of at least 35 hours of live instruction over two academic weeks or 10 school days. And what they've also said is that a district that is hybrid and meeting their 35 hours also needs to have a daily live check-in with students on all um, at-home school days. So if, you know, you're obviously having a live check-in when kids are in school. So if you have an at-home day, we have to make sure that kids are having some kind of live virtual um, check-in with um, teachers, counselors, principals, with someone in our school. So earlier in um, the year, uh, Desi had, as everybody knows, collected your district's plans and approved them. But just recently, we had to fill out a survey where we included the number of hours that our students are um, learning in school and the number of hours that they would be learning on their at-home days. And that included the number of hours that they have a live in-person contact with someone. So when we received our report card status, we received a not cleared status. Um, our preliminary reason for that is that our hybrid hours were fewer than 35. And um, in order to rectify it, what they are suggesting to us or mandating of us really is that we have to have um, an additional 45 minutes a day for the at-home days over that two week period. So our kids who are in the hybrid model and come say, for example, on Monday, but Tuesday would be their at-home day, we would need to provide at least 45 minutes of contact time for kids across the district. So that's the plan. Um, the due date for us to be able to devise and implement this change is Tuesday, January 19th, 2021, which is the Tuesday after the Martin Luther King Day holiday. So the building administrators and a couple of central office administrators, um, Assistant Superintendent Jen Parson and I are meeting on Monday, the 21st, so next Monday to start planning for these changes. We are uncertain right now if we have the personnel to make this work. We are hoping we do. Um, we're not sure, but we are hoping that that is true. If it is untrue, we may need to reopen the memorandum of agreement with the Hopkinton Teachers Association, or we may need to hire additional personnel. So I'm sure that the school committee and the community will want to stay tuned to see how that is going to play out in Hopkinton. But it is, in fact, a mandate, and we will, in fact, comply. So we do have some concerns about the Board of Education changes. And one of the things that we have learned in this process is that if the Hopkinton Public Schools were a fully remote district, we would actually be meeting these requirements. And so it feels a little punitive in some ways to be able to say that if you were fully remote, you'd be okay and you could be taken off the not cleared list. So when you see a lot of districts that aren't on the um, the not that are not on that list and they are remote, it, you can be fully remote and still meet um, the criteria. So when they cite mental health as a concern, I'm, I'm not exactly sure that, you know, being fully remote is good for kids. Nonetheless, um, they would qualify. Um, we believe, however, that the district can readily remedy the problem and it it's a little painful for us because it feels more that the focus is on quantity as opposed to quality. Um, the school committee could certainly file for a waiver, but I'm not sure that that's you know, necessarily a, a smart thing to do. So um, at this point, we will change what we're doing and the district is going to kind of keep its eyes on reopening because I think that that's the most important goal is to get our kids back in school full time. All right, so do we have some concerns? We absolutely do. I think I've just articulated some around mental health. Um, but we do worry that we have kids who are, you know, sitting at home day in and day out and have, you know, very little contact with peers or with teachers. Um, I think our greatest concern at this point in time is how do we motivate kids to get the work done on the at-home days? If we surveyed teachers across the district, they would tell us, and this is probably more so true at the middle school level and very true at the high school level, that what we need is for parents to, you know, kind of prod their kids to make sure that those things are getting done. And just to let you know, we're not expecting this to be um, something that we are putting off on the parents exclusively. Uh, Mr. Bishop had a meeting on um, Tuesday afternoon with his leadership team. So that's all the subject matter leaders at the high school. And they have brainstormed several 
really important ideas and I think things that will be effective to ensure that the work that is not getting done currently now on at-home days um, can start to get, get done on at-home days. So there'll be more to come on that. And that's all I have for you, which I'm sure is plenty. Thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh. Um, are there any questions among the school committee members, particularly on the section, I think, on um, the new DESI, DESI requirements? Once again, you've wowed us. We, we have nothing to say. Or at least silenced. One of yeah, I, I would just sort of second your sentiment that we really want to focus on getting our kids back in the schools full time as soon as we can safely do so. It's unfortunate that we, in a way that we have this sort of midpoint um, shuffle when we really want to have our eyes on uh, uh, opening the doors. So. Um, I guess, you know, I'm sorry that you have to, to deal with this. I think it is good to increase um, learning time for the students, but, you know, I think there's a lot of um, momentum around getting kids back in the doors as soon as it's safe, so. Yes, thank you. I do think a, a check-in will be helpful for kids. I, I don't think it, it ever hurts to have our kids chit-chatting and working with our teachers, whether it's for mediation or read-alouds or whatever it happens to be, it's great for our kids to be in touch with teachers. Yeah. Um, I just want to make an administrative note about the meeting. So um, we are we are being recorded, so this will be accessible to anyone in the community if, um, after today if they can't uh, see it on cable. It's on Comcast Channel 96 and Verizon Channel 31. Um, unfortunately, there were technical dif difficulties that prevent it from being on YouTube. So I think we need to forge ahead with the way we are. Um, my sincere apologies to the community who typically likes to watch on YouTube or Facebook. Um, I don't know the nature of the technical difficulties, but we are limited today to the television viewing, but it is being recorded. Thank you. Um, we're all set with the superintendent report. Okay, the chair report, very brief tonight, Dr. Cavanaugh, if you just toss my slides up, that'd be nice. Okay, just a quick chair report. Just a few emails came in. Uh, again, a lot of support for reopening um, fully in person. Um, I had a question about how to run for a school committee because elections are coming up. And I'm going to actually share some information about that with the community. Um, and we did receive a thank you email for holding office hours and making ourselves accessible to the community to share their concerns. Next slide. So regarding the school committee election, because I did get a question about how to run and, and so forth, um, just give you what I heard from our town clerk, Connor Dagan, who was great in giving me some information. Um, there are two terms for school, of school committee members that expire this year. Um, nomination papers will be available on January 19th. Um, keep an eye out for a town clerk press release about how to acquire nomination papers during COVID. Nomination papers are gonna be due back on March 30th. And I did ask if there were virtual signatures allowed this year and currently signatures must be physically collected or wet signatures, they call them, not electronic. And if anyone has any questions at all, um, please reach out to the town clerk's office or of course you can email any one of us with more questions. And that's it, the only other comment I have for a chair report is that we did have a budget advisory meeting today so we're continuing the conversations around budget and we are going to be seeing Dr. Kavanaugh's budget presentation later in this meeting. So there's really no new information, but that those conversations are continuing. Thank you. On to liaison reports. Does anyone have a liaison report tonight? I do not. Um, I went to a HOP coalition meeting this week. Um, there's no significant update for this uh, committee other than um, they are moving, we are moving ahead to um, pursue a drug free, com free communities grant, uh, which would have significant funding available over uh, I think three years for the dis for the town. Um, so we're in the process of getting that grant application together and hoping to apply for that. That's the bulk of the work going on right now. All right, office hours. We have not yet posted, they'll be um, in January next. So we'll, we'll come up with a date and please stay tuned for those. 
which brings us to new business budget recommendation, Dr. Kavanaugh. Okay. Okay. So as you know, a lot of work goes into the planning of a school budget. And this work started way back in September. Um, I want to thank all of the administrators um, and um, you know everyone who has central office administrators, all the building principals, assistant principals, the work that um, the building principals do with their teachers, their subject matter leaders, um, their uh, curriculum teacher leaders, an awful lot of work goes into the preparation of tonight's budget. And so what you're seeing really is the culmination of their work and my recommendation to you for what the FY22 budget should look like. I am very grateful to Mrs. Rothermick, who's here with me tonight. She'll go through all of the financial slides. And she uh, has certainly spent an awful lot of time working with our administrators, um, putting things into the budget, taking things out of the budget, talking about the meaning of things in the budget. And so, um, here we go. All right, I, I know I have articulated this over the last several weeks. You know, each time I've done a superintendent's report, I've kind of you know, snuck this in there just a little bit. But I think these things uh, bear repeating. And um, these are the things that we are really not quite sure about what FY22 is going to look like. And the first one of them is enrollment. Um, the budget has been planned based on the student who are in front, students who are in front of us today, coupled with predictions from a hired consultant. So we have kids here, we have some estimate of the kids who will be coming, but we're really uncertain about that. And uh, it, a lot of that has to do with the pandemic, some of the people who have left, whether or not houses are turning over, uh, so and, and when they might start turning over. And so enrollment is an absolute unknown for us for next year. Uh, all of the PPE that we are using this year, we are again uncertain as to how much of that we'll need for next year. You know, once everyone is vaccinated, you know, we're in phase two, uh, we could need a lot less PPE or, you know, we don't really know how things are going to play out and we might all still be wearing masks and using hand sanitizer and using enormous numbers of paper towels as opposed to using the air dryers because all of those were changes that we made for this year. So right now we have $187,000 that uh, is in this budget um, to prevent the, or to reduce the spread of COVID-19. And then finally, contract negotiations. We are going to be entering into negoti negotiations with three different bargaining units. That would be the Hopkinton Teachers Association, the paraprofessionals, and the school nurses. So those are our three big uncertains. All right, in terms of uh, budgetary needs, as I mentioned at the beginning, budgetary meetings were conducted with all of our stakeholders, um, department directors, curriculum leaders, building principals. And at the end of the day, you know, we, we take a look at what are our real goals as we build this budget. And um, you can see that I've bulleted them there for you. Um, one of the things that, or maybe the first and foremost thing that we look to is to maintain our exceptional academic and extracurricular programs. Um, people come to Hopkinton for a reason. They come to Hopkinton because of the excellence in the public schools. Um, and this budget is certainly designed to keep us in that place. Uh, we wanna make sure that our curriculum and our instruction meets the needs of all of our learners. You know, not just um, our, our students who are the sort of highest flyers or not just the kids who are struggling, but we wanna make sure that we have programming that meets the needs of every single student, all close to 4,000 of them in the Hopkinton public schools. We wanna be able to add teachers and support staff to accommodate increases in student population. And that, as I said in the previous slide, could mean a lot more kids next September. We really don't know. We need to address the resulting growth um, and how that impacts uh, every department. And that doesn't just mean how many students, for example, are in a math class at Hopkinton High School, but we need to remember that um, student growth impacts uh, human resources, it impacts technology, it impacts the custodial staff. So we have to remember that there are other departments than the ones that come immediately to mind and that's teachers and students in classrooms. 
We need to focus on our student needs, both academic and social emotional, as we emerge from this pandemic. We know that there are going to be some gaps in learning, but we also need to know, remember that we're going to have kids who come back to school who haven't done school in that official kind of way, in that in-person kind of way in a very, very long time. Kids who have experienced trauma, and we have to be prepared to meet those students' needs, social, emotional, as well as academic. And finally, we always have to support our school improvement plans. I want to turn the clock back for a minute and take a look at something that I showed people when we were budgeting a couple of years ago. So a couple of years ago, uh, I illustrated for our folks in Hopkinton what the 2017 per pupil expenditures looked like, and we ranked them by town. So we chose a, a number of communities. We chose them because they're high performing. We chose them because they are near us. Uh, we chose them uh, because they are similar to us demographically. Um, they may be you know, attached to 495 or whatever. Anyway, these were the, the communities that we had chosen back in 2018 as we were, um, or 2019 as we were preparing. And you can see where Hopkinton fell then. We were number 24 in this list. If we fast forward to today and we take the 2019 per pupil expenditures and we use the exact same communities, you can see where Hopkinton is today. We're at number 31. We are very close to last in that ranking. Um, so at 24 a couple of years ago, 31 now. And so I know people think that an awful lot of money is going into our school budget every year, but as you can sort of see through this ranking uh, process, um, a lot of money is going into all school budgets across Massachusetts right now. And so we are at number 31 uh, in the same set, uh, same grouping of, of communities. Despite the fact that we have slipped to number 31 in terms of um, financial um, per pupil expenditures, you can see that we are still maintaining excellence. You know that we were just recently ranked first by niche. Um, and you can see that you know, that ranking involves um, the best teachers, the best places to teach in Massachusetts and the best school districts in Massachusetts. And then you can also see that Hopkinton High School was ranked third uh, by US News and World Report. I mean, I guess I, I put all of this out there so that folks in the community can see that, um, you know, you certainly support your public schools. We would never deny that, but there's an awful lot of bang in our public schools for, for the bucks. Uh, a second aspect to our FY22 approach, uh, the budget was built on the students who are here now, as I've said. We also incorporated some thinking about um, the projections that we got from Dr. Arthur Wagman. Um, and even though we have those three uncertainties, we have approached this budget, the creation of the FY22 budget, very conservatively. So if we see a spike in our enrollment, we are going to need to revisit these personnel requests in the budget. You're going to see personnel requests, but they may be enough based on what we have planned. But in the event that we have an awful lot of kids who arrive at our door in September of 2021, we will need to revisit our personnel requests for sure. All right, I just want to have a quick review of what our enrollment looks like. Uh, for the 2021 school year, Dr. Wagman had predicted that we were gonna have 400, sorry, 4,111 students in our district. Um, we currently have about 3,922. And so if we take a look at that, we might say, oh my gosh, that's a difference of 189 students. So the, the number has gone down. That's a projection right there. We are still at an increase of 41 students given this in the process of the 2021 school year. So our enrollment hasn't declined, it has increased by 41. It just hasn't met that, that sort of number that was predicted. I'd also like to remind people that we are in December and it's in, we are in the midst of a global pandemic. So this number, when we look at what we're going to have in 2021, that number could continue to climb all the way to June 30th and still count as 2021 students. I know I've shared this slide before, but it bears repeating, I think. So how are we, how are we determining um, how many kids, you know, why are we so worried, I guess, about how many kids may be with us in September, and this is this is a big unknown for us. 
On October 1st, 2019, we had 97 students who had withdrawn from the Hopkinton Public Schools. On October 1st, 2020, we had 159 students who had withdrawn from the Hopkinton Public Schools. So there's that difference of 62. And we've got to wonder, might there be 62 students who will be returning to the Hopkinton Public Schools? In the um, 2019 school year, we had 18 students on our list for students being homeschooled. In the 2020 school year going in, we had 34 students who were on our list for homeschooling. And so again, a difference of 16 students, might they come back? They may or they may not, it's hard for us to know. In terms of withdrawals uh, from 20, for the 2021 school year, you know that we've had uh, 16 kids, well, we have 16 students who are uh, more who are on our list of homeschooling, but we also have 20 students who told us that the reason to that they were withdrawing from the Hopkin, Hopkinton Public Schools uh, was to homeschool. We had 48 students when they withdrew tell us that they were leaving us to go to a private school in the state of Massachusetts. And we've had 50 students tell us that they were um, leaving us to go to a private or a public school, school outside of the state of Massachusetts. And we have uh, 36 kids who left us to go to another public school in Massachusetts. Typically, these 36 right here who are attending another public school in the state of Massachusetts we're not all that concerned about. These aren't kids that we would imagine would come back to us because you don't leave Hopkinton in a pandemic to attend another public school that's also in a pandemic. But we do know that homeschooling and private schools offer something different perhaps from what a public school is offering in the state of Massachusetts right now. So these are the kids who have left us. We don't know how many will come back and we don't know how many students who would have been eligible for kindergarten this year have been kept out by their parents. All right, so one thing I like to do when thinking about budgeting for personnel is I like to think about students in groups of 20. Every time we have a group of 20 students, we need to hire 1.4 on average full-time educators or FTEs or teachers. So next year's projection is that there will be an additional 74 students in the Hopkinton Public Schools. They are in our, our budgeting right now, these 74 kids. So if we took that number 74 and we rounded that to 80, we would have four groups of 20 students. So if we took our four groups and we multiply that times the 1.4 teachers or FTEs, we would come up with 5.6 FTEs or teachers that we would need to hire. So as you are watching the budget numbers tonight, I hope that you'll take a look at that number 5.6 FTEs so that you can sort of see how these, these teacher asks have been built into the budget. You'll also see that teaching staff or um, personnel make up about 80% of the, the school budget. So it's really important that we take a look at the number of teachers that we're asking for, and that you know that these are teachers that we believe we need to meet those academic goals post pandemic, and to meet the social emotional goals post pandemic. So the question lingers, what happens if we exceed those 74 new students? At that point in time, we may need to access some of the Legacy Farms host community agreement funds, the HCA funds to hire additional personnel. And we're looking at that money right now as the kind of money that will provide our public schools with a safety net. If we're able to access some of that money, you know, it's there if we need it. If we don't need it, we don't have to touch it. And so at this point, I'm going to ask Mrs. Rothermick to talk a little bit about um, the numbers that go into our FY 2022 operating budget. You can see here that it's coming in at an overall increase of 5.8%. And Mrs. Rothermick can um, explain how all of that uh, came to be. Thank you. Um, as Dr. Kavanaugh stated, you know, the, the budget is a very long process and is a lot of input from all the departments um, in speaking with their staff and everything else. And so this is the culmination um, of where we landed. In addition, Dr. Kavanaugh and I have had multiple discussions with them in terms of really understanding their needs. So starting with the FY21 operating budget of 51,206, the FY22 salary increase is 2,145 or 4.2%. 
and the expense increase would be 802,000 or 1.6%. So those two added together give us our increase of 5.8% um, with a draft FY22 operating budget request as of now of 54,153,911. So one of the things that we always talk about is the, um, in a service industry, such as a school district, your costs really land in the salary side. So you can see that our budget is 80% salary and 20% um, expense. So when you're talking about changes such as enrollment, those are the changes that really drive on the salary side. So this is just another look at your budget by educational program. So you can see that regular education costs is around 54.6%. Your next large one is student services at 22.4%. So those are your biggest uh, chunks. And then you see the other educational programs kind of rounding that out. And this is another way of slicing up the budget. And this is really by cost center. So again, if you look at student services at 22% and then the high school at 18%, your elementary schools are all fairly level at 7%. Um, and then middle school is, is in between. Uh, high schools typically are more expensive than um, a middle school and then, of course, elementary school, just by the structure of, of that learning model. So that is a very typical spread that you would see in terms of the cost share. Um, so that just kind of, again, the other departments kind of round out the, the rest of those slices of the pie. So we'll take this one bucket at a time. Uh, so we'll just go through the salary piece. So if you start with the FY21 salaries of 41,252, the contractual obligations of your current staff is 1,186, which is 2.9% increase just in salaries, not looking at the overall budget. So the 2.9% increase over that 41,252. And the staff requests that have come through is 959,000 or another 2.3%. So the salaries, just looking at these two buckets, uh, represent an increase of 5.2%. So taking the salaries and breaking them down into different buckets really to give both the committee and the community an understanding as to where these um, requests fall. So again, your salary in the contractual amount is 1,186,000. Special education request for salaries is 277,000 representing 7.4 FTEs. The instructional cost and enrollment growth of 362,189, which is 5.4 FTEs. And again, referencing back to the slide that Dr. Kavanaugh spoke to earlier in terms of very simple numbers of taking groups of 20 times 1.4 teachers per, um, these numbers pretty much prove out in terms of what those requests were for enrollment growth. Instructional program enhancements, 130,336 or 1.6 FTEs, administrative support and facility enhancements of 188,873 or 4.2 FTEs. So again, the salary increase is 2,145,327. So taking the, each of those buckets and breaking those down. So student services, the 7.4 FTEs, 
that represented a 0.5 FTE intensive teaching, 4.1 FTE paraprofessionals, and that's throughout the district, a 1.0 BCBA district-wide, a 0.4 occupational therapist, 1.2 for nursing, and 0.2 support. The instructional cost and enrollment growth, the 5.4 FTEs, that's representative of Elmwood at 2.4 FTEs, and then 1.0 each for the middle school, the high school, and ESOL. The instructional program enhancements of 1.6 FTEs represents the Elmwood 1.0 FTE Adjustment Counselor and the 0.6 FTE Math Coach K-5. The administrative support and facility enhancements is a 1.0 FTE each for technology, a custodian, administrative support, and a paraprofessional, and a 0.2 FTE for the HR department. So again, that's a summary of all of those salary requests representing 18.6 FTEs or 959,000. Moving on to the expense side, starting with the FY21 expenses of 9,953,000. The expense increase for this year would be 802,000 or 8.1% just representing an increase of expenses to get to the FY22 expense of 10,756,000. So this is another slice of the pie to give you an idea of really where your expenses fall. So if you look again at student services, uh, takes a, a big piece of that pie at 27%. Uh, building and grounds, which of course represents all of your building infrastructure, your maintenance, your HVAC, um, your preventive maintenance at, at 20% and then transportation at 19. Those are really your, your biggest buckets in terms of where your expenses lie. So using that same uh, process and looking at the increase for the expenses, the expenses that are contractual, inflationary, and basically your current services represents an increase of 231,740. The increase in expenses for special education at 42,000. The increase for instructional cost, enrollment growth, and the replacement cycles is 333,000. Instructional program enhancements for expenses, we do not have any increased uh, cost at all. Administrative support and facility enhancements, there is an increase in, to our expenses of 195,000. So explaining those out, contractual inflation and current services, those lie within the departments of transportation, central office, athletics, and building and grounds. Student services, again, it's within student services, but more specifically transportation and contracted service. The instructional cost, enrollment growth and replacement cycles that is being represented within the regular education, technology and vocational tuition. Again, instructional program enhancements is at zero and the administrative support and facility enhancements is in the building and grounds and central office departments. So as we look deeper within those buckets, so again, the contractual inflation and current services, transportation, that's your contractual increase of 47,000 and a 50,000 loss of the bus fee revenue offset. And that, of course, is because of, um, you know, the reduced capacity that we've been transporting on, on the buses, the refunds that we have processed for, for families. There just is not the revenue to create that offset. Within the building and grounds department, 
there is also the loss of uh, the 77,000 for the building use revenue offset. So again, these are costs within the building and grounds that we're not able to offset using that revolving because we have not had any building rentals um, for the second half of last year and will continue for this year as well. Central office, there's an increase of 66,000 in legal, and that has also been offset by 20, 29,000 decrease in a one-time purchase from the prior year. And the increase in legal, again, is really representing of looking at our last three years of actual and just aligning that budget to what we are actually experiencing. In athletics, there's an increase of 6,000 for transportation, which is contractual, 4,000 for the cost of officials, and the MIAA sets the rate for officials. That's not something we have control over. And 9,000 in supplies, and this was a cut that we had done for FY21 to balance that budget. However, these um, programs are running, and so those supplies will still be needed. So again, for student services, um, the increase is the 26,000 for transportation and 20,000 20, for contracted services. And there were other miscellaneous decreases. Those are just your significant cost changes. Within the instructional cost, enrollment growth and replacement cycles, there is technology. 136,000 represents the Chromebook refresh for the middle school and the laptop teacher refresh for the high school. 129,000 is software and there are new software that were put into place such as Zoom, Panopto and Schoology. And then there are enrollment driven increases to software and that is reflected in your PowerSchool and Renaissance Learning which comes across as a per pupil uh, charge for each license. And the technology department was also offset by a one-time decrease of 73,000 for the purchases um, that were necessary for the new classrooms in FY21. Regular education at the middle school, there's 15,000 in textbooks, uh, professional development around, um, you know, social emotional learning and equity and supplies for student enrollment. High school, 34,000 for textbooks and supplies, again, enrollment driven. Curriculum, 57,000 for textbooks and regular education was also offset by decreases within the elementary schools. And lastly, vocational tuitions of 37,000 and these are student enrollment increases. Uh, students who opt to cho choose to go to Norfolk Aggie, um, that's representative of those tuitions. And again, the instructional program enhancements at zero and the last bucket, administrative support and facility enhancements uh, within the building and grounds uh, department is where we're carrying that uh, extra cost for PPE, the hand sanitizer, additional cleaning. Again, what De Dr. Kavanaugh alluded to earlier as you know, being one of our unknowns. Uh, so there is 187,000 that represents that. And within the central office is new software um, to manage the smart student IDs which are used for you know, the bus IDs, their touchless uh, payments within the cafeteria, and also um, the software will enhance our bus navigation. So putting all those together, so taking the salary piece where we broke it out within these buckets and then taking the expense piece and putting those together this puts the costs within each one of those categories. So together, contractual inflation and current services represents 1,417,000. Special education increase of 319,000. Again, that's a request of 7.4 FTEs. Instructional cost enrollment growth, 695,000, which 
just as a reminder, this is not just salary. Um, I don't want anybody to take the 5.4 and divide that into the 695 because you'd come up with a very expensive FTE, but that's not representative of what this is. Uh, instructional program enhancements of 130,000 and the administrative support, administrative support and facility enhancements of 383,000. So again, the increase request from the FY21 base budget to the FY22 request is 2,947,000. And from the earlier slide, it is 5.8%. And that's open for questions. And just as a reminder, we will be presenting this um, two more times in January, uh, in early January and uh, for a public forum, and then again for a school committee vote. So this will not be the last time that the community would see this presentation. It will come across uh, at least two more times. And I don't know if you'd like me to leave the presentation up while you ask questions or. Um, I think so. I have a feeling it'll come up, but th thank you both so much for this comprehensive look at the budget. This was an, I think an excellent presentation, very clear. Um, and it was easy to understand sort of where the numbers come from. I really appreciate you guys uh, taking the time to do this thorough presentation for us. Members, who has questions? Meg? Um, Thank you so much, Susan, for so clearly explaining that. Um, can you just remind us what our increase was at this point last year? Uh, goodness, I think we were above nine. That's what yeah. I thought. Right. Okay, yeah. that's why I was feeling relief. Yes. Because it's not even above six in this most horrible of years. So thank you, thank you very much. Anyone else? Nancy or Joe? Yeah, um, thank you, Susan. I really liked the format of what you just presented because I'm one who usually would be uh, asking for that level of detail, but then I just waited a slide and there it was. And then the next slide was an even greater level of detail. So I think that's exactly what we need and what the community needs. Um, it's, uh, I love the transparency of it. Uh, you're explaining the summary level and then you're drilling down a couple layers to show what's behind it and why. So I think this will generate great, great conversation. And I think you've made a strong case for what you're putting in here. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Well said, Joe. Nancy? So yeah, I, I also appreciate how specific much you break it down and how clearly it's presented for the community. I echo Meg, uh, her sentiments and that we are feel like we're in a much better place this year than we were last year in terms of uh, not having to come in quite as high as we did last year. My one lingering concern, and I know I had raised it a couple meetings ago and Ms. Parson had talked about some grant money that's available in the spring but it continues to be um, the unknown of how we're gonna be meeting some of the gaps that have been created by this unusual time. Additional supports kids may need that we may not have accounted for in this budget because I, I, I'm guessing it's probably hard to know how many needs or additional needs are gonna be in there, but things um, not just social and emotional, but also uh, any academic gaps that we might see. And I don't know if that's something that we kind of just have to wait and see when we get there and kind of address it to our ability at that point or how much cushioning we actually have here. Yeah, one thing I will say about, you know, where we, we project that we'll be with teaching and learning and gaps in what students know and are able to do. Uh, we are a district that's fortunate. I know you saw Renaissance Learning in there and um, we have, so we have, as I've said before at another me a previous meeting, we have been able to test all of our kids in ELA and math and have a sense of where they would typically be at this point in time and where they are now. And I think especially in the early literacy grades, we have you know the benchmark assessment system, LLI, 
We've got um, QRI. So there are many, many tests that we are able to give to kids when we feel like they are, they're not where we would want them to be. And so even though it might seem right now like we are missing some of those academic gaps, we're really fortunate in that we have been able to invite, you know, in the beginning, we were just inviting back any student who was on an IEP or any student who was a WIDA level one to three English learner. But we've been able to invite um, some students in who have really, you know, struggled academically in, in other ways. So we are kind of picking up the pieces there a little bit. And I think that if we if we get to a place next year and grant money, you know, we're, we're also very lucky that we have all of the title grants and we've been, you know, very lucky with grants in, in the past um, that Mrs. Parson, uh, Dr. Zaleski and other central office staff have been able to put together. But, you know, in the event that, that we need more, we won't be afraid to ask. Great, thank you. Yeah, I, I don't, you know, I just, first of all, want to say thank you to everybody who helped build this budget, because I know there was a tremendous amount of restraint um, in the ask. It, it was, this, this is a very, um, it seems high to some people, but it is a very conservative, in my opinion, um, place to be. I am concerned, as you mentioned in one of your early slides, that the enrollment is such an unknown. Um, I am definitely concerned about who may be coming, and hope, hopefully kids are coming back. Um, we don't really know who they are or where they're going to land, um, but we, you know, we may see ourselves really needing more headcount in the fall. So um, we are fortunate, I guess, in that we have uh, an HCA host community agreement that yielded a, um, a reserve for to handle growth, and so we are fortunate that we may be, may be able to tap that if we if we find ourselves in a bind. Um, it is difficult to rely on that for a one-time, you know, in a one-time year, and then you know that that builds the budget. So it is, it is tricky, but I'm at least a little bit comforted by the fact that we may be able to tap that uh, to get us through if we have a real crunch in the fall. But but it was a fabulous presentation. I think we all probably want to you know chew on it a bit. We'll be seeing it again in January, and I'm sure the community will. Um, we'll have questions too as they look through it. It was uh, so well done. It makes it easy to understand and, and know where your questions are. So really appreciate it. If there are no other questions, I think we can move on. Okay. So that brings us to the Hopkins gift account. Dr. Kavanaugh, you're back on. There we go. All right. Uh, so we have received from the Hopkinton HPTO a check in the amount of $2,123.61 for recess equipment at the Hopkins School. And so I am recommending that the school committee uh, vote to accept this very generous donation from the HPTO. I move to accept it. Motion by Meg. I second. Second by Nancy. And I will take a roll call vote. Joe, how do you vote? Aye. Meg? Aye. Nancy? Yes. And I'm an I as well, and that passes. And thank you so much to the Hopkinton PTO. It's really generous of you. Much appreciated. Right. And I believe you're on again, Dr. Kavanaugh, with the White House yeah. donation. Mm -hmm. Donation to the White House. So you know that we had done a, a lovely upgrade to the White House and our 18 to 22 program is housed there. Uh, we have had someone who has donated two desk chairs to the White House. And so we are looking for you to accept that donation of the desk chairs at the White House. We've already got the desks. We just need the chairs. I make a motion to accept this. Thank you. Motion by Meg. I second. Second by Nancy, and I will once again do a roll call vote. Joe? Aye. Meg? Aye. Nancy? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. And again, thank you very much. Yes, and thank you from Katie Hibbert and the uh, 18 to 22 program. Excellent. Okay, that brings us to the superintendent's contract. I am Pleased to announce that we have voted in executive session to approve a new successor agreement with the superintendent. Um, you make my job easy because you just did this budget presentation in which you talked about so many great things that, are, that you've been doing with the district, keeping our um, per pupil expenditure well below average and actually falling 
to, among our peers, um, all the great accolades that our district has earned and the outcomes that we've seen under your leadership um, kind of speak for themselves. The, the rankings are great, but there are so many other accomplishments that, um, that you have done that you know we are really excited that we've reached this agreement. I would like the community to know that we spent a lot of time doing uh, extensive benchmarking on compensation with peer districts. Um, as we look at our peer districts in terms of our spending, our per pupil expenditure, we're also looking at our peer superintendents and other districts and seeing um, what their compensation and their packages are like. We looked both at the tech community uh, schools as well as a broader set of peers that are more uh, high achieving and academically similar to Hopkinton. And um, we thought it was important to, to set our superintendent's salary um, you know, in line with peers in these districts. Although, um, you know, obviously we're limited fiscally and probably still a little below average, but still more in alignment than we were before. And we were uh, pleased to be able to do that. Um, the other thing I think I'll highlight before we take a vote to approve the contract is that we were really excited about establishing stability for the district uh, with Dr. Kavanaugh uh, with a five-year contract. Um, as many people know who've lived in Hopkinton, in the last uh, 10 or 12 years, we've had, I think, four superintendents. Um, and that instability can really uh, hurt the district. And so we were excited that we were able to reach a five-year agreement with Dr. Kavanaugh to um, provide the, the stability and the consistency that, and the constancy that we're gonna need as we face all the challenges on the horizon. As we all know, we're recovering from a pandemic. We're facing enrollment growth. Um, we have a lot, of, a lot of social justice initiatives that we wanna pursue. And uh, there's a lot of fiscal uncertainty. And to have uh, a leader like Dr. Kavanaugh at the helm for, for the next five years gives us great comfort. So I don't know if there are any other comments from the school committee members, but I will certainly entertain a vote um, to approve the contract for Dr. Kavanaugh. You're muted, Meg. So it never happens. <laughs> Sorry, but um, I think we echo all of your sentiments and I make a move to proceed with the contract. I second. Excellent. We have a motion by Meg, a second by Nancy. And I will once again do a roll call vote. Joe? Aye. Meg? Aye. Nancy? Yes. And I'm an aye as well. And Dr. Kavanaugh, we are thrilled to have you for the next five years. Thank you very much for all of your hard work and all of your leadership, particularly during the pandemic. It's been outstanding. Oh, well, thank you. I am thrilled to be here for the next five years. It's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, we are moving on to old business, uh, school start time discussion, Dr. Kavanaugh. All right, let me find that. All right, so I will uh, take the screen and I have actually put all three of these agenda items on slides. So maybe it will just be helpful to look at them that way. All right. So the first of these last three agenda items is school start time. Um, I wanted to kind of frame this first in, in looking at other communities um, who have made this shift. And so it wasn't, wasn't hard to find them. And two of them uh, that we're going to look at tonight are actually contiguous with Hopkinton. Uh, the first one is Ashland High School and the second is Westboro High School. Both of those communities in the last several years have done very lengthy studies to make their transition in start times to, to later times. And, um, you know, when you do that, you think about things like sleep studies, you talk about the impact that it's going to have on families, on kids who play sports, on kids who would have had academic time before the bus leaves to go to an athletic contest, on kids who have part-time jobs, on, you know, kids who need to babysit younger siblings. And all of those pieces kind of come to be when, when you start talking about school start times. And so it must have felt right for Ashland and Westboro to both do this. And so when I looked at their start and end times. Ashland is about the, the furthest out for a high school. Um, they have a start time in the morning of 8.30 
and an end time of two o'clock to uh, 55. So just five minutes of three when they, when they release their students at the end of the day. Um, as far as high schools go, that's about as far, I think, as you could push it and still kind of participate um, in athletics, you know, without, I don't know, maybe being sort of a burden to your, to your competitor. Uh, Westboro is a little bit more conservative in their approach. They have a start time of 8.06 and an end time of 2.37. So I know I have said this before uh, that we could in the town of Hopkinton, you know, roughly take our secondary schools and transition them to an eight to 230 kind of a model. It wouldn't be so dissimilar, I guess, from you know, where Westboro High School is in, in that example above. And then we can adjust our schedule to, well, our to put all of our elementary schools, I should say, on the nine to 3.30 um, cycle. So right now that would really impact the Hopkins Elementary School because they are in that like middle tier of busing. We started talking about this within the context of busing and it has kind of evolved into more of a conversation um, about you know, ju not just busing, but also all of those pieces that, that talk about kids' mental health and sleep and how does it impact families and, and all of that. So some of the benefits of making this move is that our secondary students would have more morning sleep. I don't like to say that they're gonna have more sleep because it would imply that they're gonna go to bed earlier. Sometimes we don't find that they do that, um, but they would certainly have more morning sleep. And I know that people would argue that it fits better in with you know, sort of the biorhythms of an adolescent. Um, it keeps our secondary students boarding buses earlier than the elementary school students. I know that this has been a problem in other communities when they've tried to make these transitions. Um, Ashland, for example, has uh, elementary schools that are starting in the hour of seven, a middle school that starts right at eight, I believe, and then a high school that starts at 8.30. So they still have, I think, three tiers time-wise, but they've transitioned their elementaries to going in earlier than their high school kids. Um, in uh, a third benefit is to keep all of our students hopefully boarding buses in daylight. So as they're getting on the bus in the morning, if the earliest start time that we had was roughly around eight o'clock, we wouldn't need to be putting kids on the bus pre 7 a.m. And so, you know, sometimes in, in those winter months, it can still be dark around seven, seven o'clock in the morning, but it's at that point where uh, we're, we're starting to have uh, sunrise there. Um, at the end of the day, we would still have our elementary kids getting off the bus when they would if they get off at, uh, if school ends around 315, we start boarding the buses around 315. Our kids are typically home by four, but again, it can start getting dark at, at four o'clock in those winter months. So we're kind of maximizing daylight with that eight to uh, 230 and nine to 330 model. It does align Hopkinton with other districts when we are scheduling athletic contests. It doesn't keep us sort of too early or too late. It keeps it in a comfortable spot, I think. And this will eliminate one bus run. It may over time reveal a slight cost savings, but right now you know that we're going into, I think our third year with Conley bus. And so the contract sort of is what it is. We would still be running the same number of buses. We'd still have the same number of drivers. So when it comes to paying for the bus or paying for the labor or uh, paying for the insurance, if Conley does that for their, their employees, that stuff wouldn't change. The only thing that might change in a new contract might be some fuel costs if we eliminated that, um, that second tier of busing that leaves Hopkins. And I think right now we have about 26 buses that leave Hopkins and do a very fast run geographically all over town. So at this point, what I think I'm going to recommend is um, conducting some surveys to see where, where families are, where teachers are, um, certainly having a public forum. And um, when, when we talk about having a public forum that isn't just about listening to the community, but it's also about listening to the HTA. And you know, how is this going to impact the teachers at Hopkins? How will it impact teachers at the high school, middle school? How would it impact um, families? Uh, we do have in the teacher association contract, um, the ability to change start times, but I certainly would want to hear from teachers as, as to how this would impact um, them and their families and the work that they do and even the perceptions of what teaching and learning might look like if it were altered in some way by, by start time. And you know, coaches as well, I think it's important to hear from them. But I think that that with you know, sort of the blessing of the committee, uh, I would like to move forward and do a little more explore, exploration. And if we can make that happen for um, the fall of 21, I, I think it might be worth looking at. Thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh. Other questions? 
Oh, sorry. sorry. Oh, so you go ahead, Meg. Um, I just wanted to thank Dr. Cavanaugh for pursuing this and now to follow up with surveys in public forum. I think it's just a great conversation for the community to have. And thank you for including the teachers as part of that. Thanks. Thanks, Meg. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, is it is it possible to just briefly cover what I know is always a, a, a question that comes up, at, it'll come up in the forums, but is, is there ever a possibility of swapping because you have the um, elementary school starting later and the high school starting earlier? Some people will say, um, Josh, could we swap that and have the high school start later? Those are the kids who, who stay up late and you need the extra hour in the morning. Is there a quick answer to that? Um, you certainly can do that. Other, other communities have done it. Um, and as when I pointed out Ashland, you can see that they are, uh, well, I can tell you that they are one of the, the later start and end times. So their kids are getting out at three o'clock. So that, that would be about where you'd need to be in terms of, I think, athletics. So if we're going to make that switch, it might mean that our youngest kids are getting on the bus at, you know, may, it could be Pre seven. One of the things that we know is if we're going to switch to two tiers of busing, we need to have a full hour between the two start times. So if we're if we're thinking about letting the high school out, three thirty might be a little late for high school. You know, so it might just be a little bit earlier start than eight for our elementaries. But other than that, I I don't see any reason why it couldn't happen. I do think with that. I would want to be careful to make sure that the community is on board with that. I, I think it was Holliston had some difficulty with backlash from people in the community who were not in support of that. And one of the reasons was it, people relying on their secondary students to get their elementary students off the bus um, in terms of childcare. Yeah, this is great. I think um, all these kind of things will come up in the public forum. So I don't want to delay with hypothetical conversations that might come up because they they will come up. <laughs> Agree. Approach to take. Thank you. Nancy, did you have any other questions or comments? No, just I appreciate the, uh, the thought that's gone into this uh, and it seems like it could, you know, feasibly go forward for next year even and could something that we could implement to make a positive change without uh, incurring a, a large financial cost. So thank you. And I will share that we did receive an email today um, in support of this, the idea of, of moving to later start times um, as soon as possible. I think the person who emailed was looking for no one's to start earlier than nine, but, um, but I think there is probably, you know, good portion of the community that would be very interested in having these this discussion and answering your surveys and going to a public forum. This is certainly something that that uh, people are interested in talking about and learning more about. Um, I don't know if you need a vote from us, but it sounds like you have general agreement to move ahead with your plan to do more investigation. And I de definitely appreciate that you are looking at all the stakeholders, the teachers, the parents and the students. Do, would you like us to vote or do you? No, I, I'm fine really going forward with, you know, survey and public forum information. And I can always bring that, continue to bring it back to the committee. And, you know, we can talk more about it. I mean, at some point you may say you want to do a full year study and, and we could do that as well. Or, you know, you could get to a place where you think that on, you know, September of 2021, we're ready to roll with this. But I think right now it's just time to start exploring where the community and where the schools are on, on this. Excellent. Thank you. Is there any, anything more on this or can we move on to the next topic? We're good? All righty. Um, Full-time in-person reopening discussion. Okay. I'll just run through a couple of things and then, you know, Clearly, we can talk more about things. Um, but at, as everyone knows, the goal is to have a full-time in-person reopening of the Hopkinton Public Schools. There's undeniably, and I think we heard it in the budget hearings the other, I mean, the uh, Board of Elementary and Secondary Education hearings the other day, we hear it all the time. And we all agree, everyone agrees, that full-time in-person education is the best kind of education we can offer our kids. 
and we know that we want to get them back there and we want to make sure that we are doing this safely. But it is time to start planning for this. And so it's time, I think, to start establishing a committee to look at this. And so on this committee, I, I was when we did our committee to do a reentry last time, I think that the committee had to be large and it was large and it was a little unwieldy at times, but we broke into subcommittees and it worked really nicely. Uh, but I don't think we need sort of that cast of thousands right now. And I don't think that we do because I think our five building principals are really experts at reopening schools. I mean, they've done it. I mean, if we look at the, the amazing number of years that they have of experience, you know, we've, we've had people in, you know, the hundreds of years worth of either being, you know, this is my first day, or I've actually fully opened a building as a building principal, but we've got a lot of years of experience with that group. So they know how to open a building. The questions will be, when is it safe to do that? Um, and, and how much work will it take within the departments in our schools to make that happen? So to get this committee going, I'd like to have um, Mrs. Rothamick, our Director of Finance and Operations, as well as Tim Person, the Director of Facilities. I would like to have Ashok Ghosh, the Director of Technology, and Linda Henderson, who is the Manager of Student Information Systems. They are four people that will really be integral because those are big spaces that we would need to kind of like make sure everything is going to be okay. Um, we need our five building principals. We would love to have a school committee member if one of you would like to join us. Um, I am inviting in two parents and only two. Last time we had suggested we would take five and we ended up taking 10. But in this situation, it will be nice to have the voice of a parent, but um, not a cast of thousands again. Um, and then our public health official, Sean McAuliffe, absolutely necessary, uh, union representation and a couple of teachers at least. This is where I am now. I'm certainly you know, open to kind of wiggling uh, where we are with, with that, that group. Um, but I'd like to begin meeting in January. I will be sending out an invitation to parents to participate and really we will only be choosing two. So maybe it will even be sort of an out of the hat kind of thing, I don't know. Um, but the other thing that will need to happen or other things that will need to happen is we will be following the trajectory of the virus. We'll wanna make sure that we're staying in the yellow um, or better. And um, certainly we wanna look at the vaccine timelines and the plan. I mean, I really like the fact that we are in phase two and we'll be having you know, educators being vaccinated very shortly, which is really, really encouraging. You know, Just in exchanging text today with our head nurse, Kathy Bain, uh, she's already getting documentation about what the you know, inoculation process is going to look like. And I can't tell you how how, what a relief it is to actually start seeing that paperwork come across our desks um, virtually, of course, but it's really, really exciting. And um, naturally, we will continue to update the school committee and the public on the process of this committee and, and hopefully have something in place soon that kind of outlines where we hope to be when we are opening our doors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, committee members, I'm sure there are questions, comments, Nancy? Sure. I do have a quick question. Uh, will part of this process include uh, a survey of the, com the community of the parents, uh, just in terms of some of the changes, how comfortable parents are with them to make sure that we have solid backing of the community? Surely, I am happy to do that. You know, I know that we hear a lot of voices right now about people who, from people who would like us to open our doors and surely we would like to be able to do that. But I also know that there are folks out there who you know, have a little bit of fear and trepidation about what's it going to look like if my child is only three feet apart from someone. But you no, know, I think once we're in a place where, Sean used to say this all summer, Sean McAuliffe, the public health official, that if the virus was very low in the community, the virus wouldn't be coming into our schools. And I know that at the time when he was saying that it would that would that would stress a lot of people out because it was such an unknown at the time. But I feel like now, you know, an earlier slide that we saw tonight, we've had 38 cases all told in the Hopkinton Public Schools, adults and children. And, you know, while that's not a low number when we think about it, it is a low number comparatively, you know, when we look at other communities or we look at the number of kids that we have, would we like our number to be zero? Yes, we would. Um, but I'm not sure how realistic that is before we'll be able to open our doors. Dr. Cowan, can I ask a, sorry, Nancy, a clarifying question on Nancy's question. Um, if we open fully in person this year, are we still mandated to still provide a remote option for families who opt for that? 
We are. And okay. I think one of the things that we're going to look at is that if there is a family that is remote, um, we're, we're probably going to need to keep that family remote. I mean, we'll explore it, but I cannot imagine that we're going to be able to shift classes such that we're able to bring remote students back in that full-time model. But if a family is currently hybrid and they're, they're, they're not comfortable with maybe the reopening, is, can they go fully remote? I, I, I you know, don't want to promise that we could, we could do that, but we would make every effort to, to make that happen. But again, it would require, so right now, if we think about where our remote classrooms are, like at Hopkins, for example, we might have up to 28 kids in that classroom. So right. for a hybrid student to want to go into a remote setting, it would be precluded, I think, in like grades four and five. Okay. You know? Thank you. Yep. Yeah. I, I mean, I just really need to be very honest with people about what it looks like in terms of numbers. You know, it, it's a hard sort of game to play moving students around and, and we have to be really honest about where kids, you know, will fit into classrooms. And then of course, there's the issue of, you've had the same teacher since September, you've had the same peers, you know, how healthy is it for a student to try to find their way into a new classroom where relationships are established? It's almost like being the new kid. Yeah, okay, go ahead, Nancy. So I just wanted to highlight a little bit about what you were saying a minute ago, Dr. Cavanaugh, about the cases in the schools. I, I noted from your presentation earlier, the five active cases, I think it, if my count was correct in looking at the slide, five active cases in the schools currently, but town-wide, town I know that there are like 30 active cases. That's what came out from the Board of Health today. So the schools are actually a small piece of what's going on in town percentage wise. Yes, absolutely. And you know, I know that people would beg to differ, but we really have no evidence of any transmission of that virus within the schools. Maker Joe, do you have any questions or comments? Yeah, thank you. I'm really happy to see this. Um, I think it shifts the discussion from the, the barriers to reentry to more of a conversation about the road to reopening. And uh, as we saw, we, we hear from the community, um, let's, let's get a plan in place. Clearly, there's, there's some push to, to just reopen or increase the hours or something better than we have by a good, good section of the community. And clearly we can't do that without planning. So I, I, I like that we're starting a plan. Um, as for you know, community input on whether we should reopen more than we are today, I think it's important to anchor ourselves on this planning effort is a plan for the reopening. Right, The discussion about whether we do it or not is a separate discussion. So in our surveys on the plan for reopening, we wanna keep that distinction in mind, right? Mm -hmm. We're agreeing there, there needs to be a plan in place for an eventual reopening. My only other comment was, uh, thought was, initially I thought, gee, all these, all, all this, power to do the planning is within the superintendent's authority already. And as I look through your list, <laughs> that is true, but I do respect the fact that you are broadening it a bit and giving it kind of the, the feel of a, a, a task force, uh, but certainly you have the authority to do this within the superintendent's domain already. Uh, yet on hearing you present it, I'm, I'm convinced this is a this is a good way to go about it. So thank you. Thank you. I'm very excited to see this. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I do feel like bringing these people together lends that respect that is due to the employees of the Hopkinton Public Schools. You know, there's an awful lot of work to be done, and I need to hear from them what that looks like when they're the person who is, you know, boots on the ground doing the work. So are you looking for a vote from us to, to launch this committee as well as probably somebody uh, from the school committee to identify, or do you wanna wait on, the, on pieces of that? Um, I, because 
there would be a single school committee member. And because this is sort of a, a working group, I don't necessarily know that we have to deem it a subcommittee. Um, that's entirely up to, to you if you would like to do that. Um, or and, and the second thing is you would probably have to vote to choose which one of you is going to, to serve here. But again, that's entirely up to you when you would like to do that. It might be worthwhile to wait until Leah's with us in case she wants to express if that, if this is just my, my opinion, but if um, that's not going to throw you off, I think our first meeting is like January 4th in the new year anyway, because we moving to the Mondays. It is. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's perfectly fine. Um, I think in the agenda tonight, it was only listed as a discussion. I have nothing to add to what my colleagues have said. I think this is a great step forward. I'm excited. I'm, I'm also really excited about the vaccine phasing and the, you know, the approach that Massachusetts has taken. It's just, it's just so nice to see hope and the light at the end of the tunnel. And I think getting this plan in place so that we are ready to embrace um, conditions when they're presented to us so that we can reopen is a great next step. Um, I will share that we did get another email I said that I would share um, today from someone who, you know, is a single parent and, you know, really challenged by the current model, um, challenged by the cost of childcare, challenged by the hybrid model and trying to keep down a job. And, and, you know, we are, we've said it before and I'll, I think it, it bears saying again that we are very thankful for the work that the parents and the families have done to hold it together during this pandemic and you know and you know on the flip side we hear that the work over and over again from parents that the teachers are doing and constantly pivoting to quarantine and this and that and i mean just the amount of work that the community together has done is phenomenal so i'm I, i'm excited about the light at the end of the tunnel i think people are going to be happy to to see this committee launched and um we will get you somebody from school committee at the january 4th meeting Right before I go off this slide, I also should add that I will need to put our head nurse on this list. Somehow, oh. I'm not sure how she didn't get there, but she will certainly need to be there because she's a key player in COVID-19. Definitely. All right. All right, that brings us to HCA funds discussion for the town warrant. Okay. Um, so we've talked a little bit tonight about the HCA funds and how they could be used in, in with enrollment being a variable, how they could be used as a safety net and we could touch them if we need to or not touch them if we don't need to. But we do need a dollar amount or at least to have the beginnings of a discussion about a dollar amount um, for the town meeting warrant. Uh, because if we, if we wanna use these funds, we have to have a people vote to allow us to use those funds. Uh, so um, when, if we go back to our um, 20 students are equal to 1.4 FTEs. Uh, so imagine that in the fall, we are off in our estimate of enrollment by 100 students, K to 12 or pre-K to 12. If we took those 100 students and we divided them into five sections of 20, we would have five sections of 20 times 1.4 FTEs, which would get us to the place where we would think we might need to hire about seven full-time teachers. And when we budget for a teacher, we typically budget somewhere around $70,000. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're bound to that number. We could hire somebody who wows us at a much you know, higher step. We could hire someone right out of school who also wows us at a much lower step. But $70,000 is where we typically set our, our budgeting for new hires. So if we took our five, our seven FTEs that we are imagining we would need if we were off by 100 students, and we budgeted them at $70,000 a piece, we're talking about $490,000. So just as sort of an initial recommendation, I'm thinking that we might be looking at about a half million dollars or $500,000 worth of HCA money to kind of pull and say, you know, this is this might be the money that we need to put that sort of Band-Aid um, on, on the personnel budget for the year. Um, you know, as I've said, you don't necessarily have to touch the money, but it's there. But the one thing that I think we have to be aware of is that if you add $500,000 to the FY22 budget due to enrollment, those 100 students aren't going to disappear in FY23. So essentially we are adding to the foundation of the FY22 budget. 
Thank you. Um, Ms. Rodman, before I take uh, questions from the committee members, can I, uh, can you verify the HCA funds? I mean, my recollection has that um, as of July 31st, 2020, we had a balance of about $2 million. But I'd have you... to, act, yeah, I'd have to actually go and check what that number is. So okay. I, I apologize. I don't know that off the top. That's fine. I think, yeah, I just, I think I saw that we had a $1.2 million allocation on, on July 31st, which brought our balance around 2 million, mm -hmm. which just to put in context, what 500,000 would be. Correct. So are we ready to ask a question? Please ask uh, away. So my recollection is if we have that $500,000 moved so that we're able to use it, if we don't actually need it and we don't have this happen, we don't lose the money from our control. Is that accurate? That, that, that is correct. So it, it just moves into a, an account that is under the school committee's jurisdiction, but it, it's similar to a revolving account. So it's not like a capital that expires in two years. It would stay within that account. So my next question then is, is the 500,000, would it benefit us to ask for a little bit more just in case there are other unanticipated growth related expenses that come up that you know we don't know about now if we're not gonna lose the money anyway? Or is that just not, or is that make it more challenging at town meeting? It is an interesting question because, you know, what this looks at really is about 100 kids. And when we were looking at the slide that said how many students have left us to be homeschooled, I think the number was 20. How many students have left us to go to a private school in Massachusetts? I think the number might have been like 38. But what we were seeing is, you know, there could have been 70 kids on that slide alone. And so, you know, with kids moving into the district, you could exceed the 100 students, you know, just in terms of more kids that we hadn't really accounted for. Um, we need to remember too, that we did budget for 74 additional kids. So we would have to exceed 174 kids to need this particular amount, to exceed this particular amount of, of, of money in terms of um, personnel. But you know, with another 100 kids comes other costs, of course. Um, I think this is safe, but you do raise a good point that that you could need more. You could. Other questions? Joe? Uh, uh, thanks. No, I'm, I'm willing to take uh, Ms. Rothman's recommendation on this one. Um, I just would add, you know, I remember from being on the planning board in 2008, that whole mechanism of the host community agreement was put in place specifically to address the anticipated uh, impact on school budget. So it was specifically identified at that time as school, uh, as funding designated for the schools. So uh, as, as much uh, we can do prudently, you know, to, uh, I, I know we don't want to get addicted to this kind of way of funding, uh, but, um, you know, I'd be open to whatever is recommended to us from the finance team. That's a good point. Meg, did you have any questions or comments? So are you seeking a vote tonight, Dr. Kavanaugh, to approve this or can we come, we'll be having budget discussions in January. Can we come back to this and let us sort of think more about it? And uh, maybe Ms. Rothermick, if we can come back with a balance, the correct figures on the account balance. Will that work? Or do you need to submit a number before January 4th? Uh, I could look at it in my calendar, but I don't think we have to do it before January 4th. It's the end of January, isn't it? I, I believe so. And I do have, we did put in placeholder um, request. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, just putting in that number um, gives us the flexibility. So the, the placeholder holder language is already there for the warrant. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you for bringing this forward. I think it is important for us to be prepared for the unexpected in the fall. 
if that's one thing that we've learned this year, <laughs> I think we can take that to the bank. So I appreciate that. I think we can move on unless there's something else you need here on that. No, that's okay. good. Committee members, we're up to future agenda items. We're looking at uh, January 4th. Anybody or, or beyond? Anyone have any agenda items? Okay. Um, and that brings us to adjournment. No items by consensus. Tonight. I know, I had to look twice. I was scrolling back and forth. Um, do we have a motion to adjourn? I think that's my job. <laughs> it's time to make a motion to adjourn. Okay, motion by me. Second by Nancy. I will do a roll call vote. Uh, Joe? Aye. Nancy? Yes. Meg? Aye. And I'm and I as well. And we are adjourned at 8.52 p.m. And I would like to wish everyone a wonderful winter vacation coming up eventually and a wonderful holiday season. And that's all I have. Thank right. you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Happy Take holiday. care. Bye. Bye.